You guys are ready? We got Janet here today. What's up, Janet? How you doing? Your hair looks good. Come on now. It looks good. Look, yeah, it looks great. Amen. Cool. My hair's getting John the Baptist long, man. Watch out, man. We ready? Hey, just want to greet everybody. We love you guys. We're glad that you're being a part of what we're doing this morning. Uh, we've already had church, and uh, we're going to continue to. So uh, Luke 16, and I just want to share this real quick. And I want, to, I want to preface it with this. Understand this. God's faithfulness to you is never based on your faithfulness to Him. That is the most. That is such an important thing to understand because if you think that God's faithfulness to you is based on your faithfulness to Him, then you will always be looking to yourself to save you. Okay? How many of you know when the thief was on the cross, um, he didn't have a lot of faithfulness that he could boast in? You know what I'm saying? I mean, this brother's being crucified for... for, for um, for stealing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and he has nothing he can boast in. And Jesus says to him, uh, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So how many know when we all come to the Lord, we don't boast in our faithfulness? Can I get an amen? It's important to understand that because if you don't understand that, then you'll always be at this point where you're, you feel like you're under pressure, okay, in order to perform. And we never want that. But how many know at the same time, Faithfulness is important. Can I get an amen? Because our God is faithful. He wants uh, to teach us how to be faithful so that we can represent him properly in the earth. And um, because the reality is, check it out, everything that we have down here, it's stewardship. There's nothing that you don't actually own anything. The breath you breathe is given to you by the Lord. Amen. The clothes you wear, even the body you're living in. How many know it's on loan? <laughs> I mean, you know, it goes back to the ground eventually, right? And so um, stewardship is, is a huge thing in the kingdom of God because God wants to give us things, and he wants to, us to learn how to be faithful over those things and steward those things, right? And, I'm gonna, and so I want to preface every, what I'm about to read by understanding that God's faithfulness to you is not based on your faithfulness to him. But in Luke 16, and in verse 10, it says, He who is faithful in what is least is is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the true riches? Now, everybody know what the unrighteous mammon is? I mean, that's money. I'm talking about money here. And it says, um, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and money at the same time. And so, back here in verse 11, it says, Therefore, if you've been faithful in the unrighteous man, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Everybody say true riches. See, money is low on God's priority list. And so God, God, God says there's true riches that's greater than the, the riches in our wallet, right? And so, but there is a faithfulness with finances that um, it's funny because in the world that we live in, money's like up here and everything else is down here. And in God's kingdom, it's the exact opposite of that. God says, you know, the true riches are greater than money. But at the same time, God wants to teach us how to be faithful with it because here's the reality. And, and understand this. God's blessing towards you is not based on your faithfulness towards him. This is unmerited and undeserved favor. But in the same, if, let's say that I have two groups here. We have, we have Bible study at Connie's all the time, and there's generally a snacks on the table. There's generally snacks, right? And so let's say I'm going to hand the snacks out. I'm about to call you out. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Come on, give me a fist bump. It won't be that bad, I promise. Actually, I won't. I won't call you out. I'll call Beth out. Um, let's say that I have cookies up here, right? And I, and I want to get cookies to everybody, right? And I know that if I give this young man the cookies, that he's going to pass them, and he's going to give them to other people. But if I know if I give Beth the cookies, that Beth, she might not pass the cookies. You know what I'm saying? She might just straight up eat the cookies. I can say this about Beth because it's not 
True. She would pass the cookies. But if I'm up here and I got all the cookies and I want to get cookies to people, I mean, I'm going to give it to the person that's generous. I'm going to give it to the person that's actually going to share it with other people. Because if I don't do that, then other people are not going to get cookies. And so when it comes to God, when God understands that he can get things to you and through you, he'll bring more stuff into your life. It's just the absolute truth. But if, if he knows as soon as he gets something to you because you're afraid, because fear is always the motivation for selfishness, because you're afraid you hoard it all to yourself, how many know God is still going to get things to you, but he knows he's not going to be able to bless people through your life? And since he knows that, he, he, he's certainly going to take care of you because he takes care of the sparrow. Can I get an amen? But at the same time, he's actually going to put more into someone's life who he can get it through them so that they can be a blessing to other people. Because ultimately, God not only wants to give miracles to you, he wants you to be the miracle that, for somebody else. How I many of you know it's awesome to get your own personal needs met, but it's a beautiful thing when you get to be the person that actually helps meet somebody else's need. Can I get an amen? And so with this, with this passage of Scripture, it's talking about being faithful with the, with the unrighteous man, but it's talking about being faithful with money. And the only thing that causes us to be stingy, ladies and gentlemen, is fear. It's fear. Because we're scared that God's not going to take care of our tomorrow. And so one of the things that God wants to teach everybody how to do is he wants to, to love you so strong that you're not scared to give. Can I get an amen? Because you know as you give, you know more's coming because you know God's going to take care of you. Can I get an amen? And then all of a sudden, it becomes like this flow in your life. And you get to enjoy being a giver. And then you're a giver, and it's fun, and you get to help people, and you get to take care of people, and you're not concerned about tomorrow because you know more's coming. I'm telling you, it's the truth. And it has absolutely nothing at all to do with your job. I'm telling you. I mean, praise God, for, praise God for a good job. Praise God for a paycheck. Praise God for those things. But how many know God wants to bless you beyond your paycheck? The Bible says give, and men will give into your bosom. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen? And, and man, one of the things I'm grateful for is uh, I really enjoy being generous. It feels so good to, to bless people. And God wants to teach all of his kids how to be generous so we don't live in fear and we don't end up serving money rather than money serving us. Can you get an amen? See, and this is just good teaching here. This is, this is, not, this is not pressure. This is not uh, control. This is none of these things. God says, hey, man, I want to be able to pass cookies to you and get cookies through you. Amen? <laughs> so if you need a cookie envelope this morning, just uh, lift your hand up. Amen. See, I didn't call you out. That's called love. Love covers the multitude. When, when, I did call you out, and I repent. See, when, when, at the Bible study at Paul and Connie's, they always keep the cookies away from me and Josiah because they know that we're going to eat them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I did. I did. I remember that. Was it you? You ain't calling no names, right? All right. Let me give this to my wife, and she can put it in an envelope. Thank you. You can't talk talk too much about cookies, man. You just man, anybody been been being attacked by Easter candy here lately? I have had Easter candy just attacking me, man. It's like just accosting me and jumping in my mouth. You know, hunts me down, man. I was doing really good on sweets until Easter rolled around, and man, how have I been doing on sweets, Stay. Talk about it. All the good candy. How you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I did, man. I did. It's been really bad. Y'all need to pray for me, man. Cause I see, I I justify it by thinking I'll buy more candy, but I don't. I just eat it all. <laughs> oh, easy now. Now we're getting now we're getting deep. <laughs> I wasn't trying to take it that far. Yeah, don't give that young lady back there a mic, okay? Because. No. <laughs> He that has not eaten the chocolate bunny can cast the first stone, man. No, I haven't done well this year. And I did so good, man. But, man, that Easter candy hit my house and praise God. Ate all the bunnies, man. 
They have a secret stash away from me. I encourage them. I'm like, if it's not in my visual sight, I do okay. But if I can see it, it talks to me. So I'm just like, hide it from me. Even if I know where you hit it, at least I don't see it. So, amen. Just sharing some of my personal challenges here. Amen. There's deliverance for me, right? Really, there's deliverance for my wife and my son. (laughs) No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I just like candy. (laughs) It's far from me. Father, we thank you for uh, your faithfulness and the opportunity to give. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's turn to Acts chapter 1. And uh, we're probably not going to preach long today because we've had such a good time already, and that's awesome. Uh Uh-oh. It's not about me not throwing the rappers away, is it? Oh, that's right. Yes. How many of there's a lot of people that lost a lot of stuff in the flood? Well, they're going to shoot me a list of some things that they need, and then we're going to post it, and we're going to start announcing it, and we can start bringing in, and we can start helping these families. Can I get an Amen. I mean, oh, that's what the church is called to do anyway. The government's not called to do that. We're called to do that. And so they haven't given me a list of what they need just yet. Um, but as soon as they start sending the listing, we can get details and we can start just helping people out, you know. A lot of people in the Paris area uh, suffered some really bad flooding. So praise God. Hallelujah. Were you going to say something? Okay, we'll bring in a, bring in a list and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going on it. We've, when we bring a list in, we generally knock it out, so... Okay, let's turn to Acts chapter 1, and uh, we'll be short and sweet today, but I just want to kind of, we're going to start a series. Um, man, I've been so excited about this. God has been just revealing stuff to me about this and really uh, just breathing it into my heart, and, and I'm just super excited. But um, how many know that, you know, last week was when Jesus commemorates the moment where Jesus rose again from the dead, Right? But see, the thing about it is, after he rose again from the dead, he had 40 days on earth where he ministered out of his resurrected body. There were 40 days of ministry where Jesus was ministering in this fashion. And, you know, so that would be like this. Let me put it in hard numbers for you. Jesus raised again from the dead, April 5th, and then Jesus ministered until May 14th. So it'd be kind of like somebody coming to town and, and uh, having ministry and traveling around and visiting different people and all that. He, but he, from April 5th to May 14th, no, those might not be exact dates, but I just want to give you an idea. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, resurrected from the dead. How many know when his resurrected body was different? How many know in Jesus' resurrected form, how many know he walked through walls? He did. He freaked the disciples out. You know he had fun with that. <laughs> it's so funny. They were all freaked out, and they were the persecution, and the Bible says that he walked through the wall and appeared to them, and they were scared until he spoke. You know, I mean, how many know that would be maybe challenging on your soul? Even if it was Jesus, he walked through the wall, and they're like, ah! And he's like, peace, be still, it's okay, you know. But for 40 days, he had this powerful supernatural ministry, and let's take a look and see what he actually ministered. Acts chapter 1, and in verse 1, it says, the, the, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was his message. Now, it says that he, he had many infallible proofs. In other words, how many know that he came to Thomas and said, Hey, put your, put your hand in my side. Put your, put your hand in, 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 in the, the wounds in my, in my hand. And, and he, there were different things that he did. He gave infallible proofs of his existence and his resurrection. But it makes it very clear He was speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, how many know that's important? You ever get ready to leave the house and your spouse has last minute instructions? Right before you leave, a couple honeydews on the way out or whatever. How many know the last thing you say to somebody is important? Even more so 
when how I many Jesus is about to ascend to heaven and he's not going to be in earthly form on this planet for a long time bodily form on this planet for a long time. So he has some very important things and some important instruction that he's about to make, and it makes it very clear that what he shared on was the kingdom of God. And so what we're going to do, and this is God's really been just birthing this in me, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God, what it is, what it means to us, and, and, and how it pertains to the life that we live right now. Now, let's, let's turn to um, Matthew chapter 3, and we'll see that, so the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Now, what is, what is a kingdom? Well, it's, it's the king's dominion. How many know that Jesus is a king? How many, we, we were not created to be ruled by governments. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating anarchy. How many know Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, give to God what's God's. So we don't advocate anarchy in any shape, form, or fashion. But at the same time, how many know we were not actually created to be ruled by people? How many know people don't rule perfectly? But as this kingdom that God has infiltrated the earth with, how many know that our king is a mighty and awesome ruler? Jesus is going to have fair uh, legislator. <laughs> Jesus is going to have fair everything. How many know he's going to rule justly, and he's going to rule correctly, and he's going to rule right? We will never have to be concerned about our king becoming corrupt. We will never have to be concerned um, about, about that. Why? Because we are, not, we are created to be, to, to, for, for God to be our king. Amen? And so in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist comes. He's the forerunner. He's coming and he's setting the stage for Jesus' ministry. And he's got a message that he's bringing to the people. And the amazing thing about John the Baptist that kind of amazes me, John did not go to the people. The people came to John. And John didn't have, John, um, he wasn't like a user-friendly church. <laughs> Nothing against that at all. I, I'm all about meeting people and helping people. I'm, I will, you will never hear me be critical of that. There's nothing wrong with... How I many you know if you can get people to come to Jesus, any way you can do it is good? You know, my days of being elitist and being critical towards other ministries are completely over. God's working through everybody. Amen? As long as we're directing people to Jesus. But anyway, Brother John, though, he did not have a user-friendly ministry. This brother was in the wilderness. Okay? And he looked weird. Y'all think I look weird? John the Baptist got me way beat. He looked like Donovan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Appreciate Donovan, man. But he was a Nazarite, and so he never had cut his hair. Y'all think I got long hair? Think Donovan got long hair? This brother had some hair. I mean, there's. I mean, never. How I many know if you never cut your hair, you got some serious hair? I'm assuming there's probably some dreadlocks involved. You know. John the Baptist probably, I mean, you know, don't quote me on that. This is not a doctrine. This is the, the first ministry of dreadlock, John the Baptist, you know. Not going to become a denomination or anything. But he had some big hair and long hair. And then not only that, his clothing was a little strange. How I many know if I rolled up in here in, so, in, a, in some camel hair, uh, it'd be, y'all would be a little surprised, wouldn't you? Some camel hair jeans, you know. I can only imagine what that looked like, you know. Camera held, designer jeans. And, yeah, Stacy would not allow that to go out of the house. Amen. Y'all can just thank God that, that, that she helps filter my sense of style. Because if I did not have a filter on my sense of style, it would just be bad. Because I don't match. I can't match. I tend to choose things that are weird. And, you know, if I get dressed and she's not around, it's like, oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm like, you mean this doesn't match? He's like, no, it doesn't match. I don't understand the concept of matching. I've tried, but I don't understand it. So, anyway, y'all can thank God for Stacy on that. But, but John the Baptist, long hair, camel's, ca camel's hair clothing. And then not only that, this brother's eating weird stuff, right? He's eating honey and locusts. What if y'all came in here one morning and I was eating bugs and dipping them in honey? Y'all would come in the door and you'd slowly move out. You'd be like, all right, praise the Lord, brother. You have a great day. I'm over. <laughs> 
So this is not a user-friendly personality. This is not a, it's not a user-friendly message. And then beyond that, he's preaching in the wilderness, and yet multitudes of people come to see him. And I'm still trying to understand how that happens. I mean, why? Why would people, I mean, it's maybe like a sideshow. Come see this dude, man. He's crazy. He's got this crazy hair, and he's eating locusts, and, you know, he's talking about the kingdom. But there was something. He had the ability to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And I'm here to tell you right now that God is going to do that in the earth before Jesus' return. And uh, because that's the breakdown. Rebellion takes place because the kids think the dads are against them, and the dads think the kids don't respect them. I mean, you know, that's a, a good portion of the demonic ministry is to cause the children to rebel against the fathers and to cause the fathers to not care about the children and to seek their own things. And so um, that's a part of that ministry, and it's a huge ministry, and I believe with all my heart that God is going to do that in the earth. Because when you see the hearts of the fathers turn to the children, the hearts of the children turn to the fathers, we don't have generational divides anymore. We don't have, well, you listen to this music, and I listen to that music, and you wear these clothes, and I wear those clothes. All of these things melt because the fathers love the children, and the children can begin to trust in the father's love for them. And all of a sudden, there's a united front against the enemy's rebellion. I'm just telling you, folks. And this generation that is currently you know, being raised up on this planet and everybody's so concerned because they're anti-religion and a lot of them are anti-God and looks like Christianity's dying. I'm telling you right now, folks, God is setting the stage for the greatest move of God this planet has ever seen. Do you think he can do it? Oh, yes. Yes, he can. He's going to do it. And it's going to be amazing. And a part of what he's going to do is he's going he's gonna to he's gonna destroy rebellion and turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children to the fathers. Amen? And so this is what John the Baptist was doing. Talks about it in the, in, in the book of Malachi. But yet droves of people are coming out to see this guy. And this is his, excuse me, this is his message. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so... He comes, now, you got to understand, this word, this, repent is not a bad word. I mean, you know, just because something has been used in a, bad, in, in a bad context, that it does not mean that it is bad. I mean, we, 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 the, that word repent has been used so much in a bad context that people even tend to make fun of it. Repent! You ever heard that before? And, 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 but repentance is not about hellfire and brimstone. Repentance is not about fear. Repentance is not about being scared of God. Repentance is, is the word metanoia in the Greek, and it simply means this, to change your mind. We can demystify this word and bring forth an understanding that it, what he's saying to the people is this, change your mind. There's a new way of doing things that's coming. He said the kingdom is at hand. How many know he was not the king of the kingdom? I mean, you know how excited he must have been? Because he knows the king's coming. He's like, the king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. And he was so excited about the king coming. Ah. And he's saying, we've got to change the way we're thinking because the king is coming. And when the king comes, there's going to be a new kingdom. And there's going to be a new way of doing things. And God is going to take his kingdom and infiltrate the earth and turn man's kingdom upside down. And so this is his statement, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so this word repentance means to change your mind. Now here's the thing. When you change your mind, you will change your behavior. If, I, if in my mind I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to walk towards that speaker. But in here all of a sudden I think, no, I'm going to turn around. As I think that, that thought is going to manifest and I'm going to repent and go back this way. Are y'all tracking me here? Because see, you can have change of behavior without change of mind. And that's where we've missed it in the concept of repentance because how I many of y'all sometimes people will change what they're doing for somebody else? That is not real repentance. If, if someone comes up, say someone, say someone comes to the altar one day. You know, they're coming up and they're going to, 
They're coming up, but they're not coming to the altar to meet Jesus. They're coming to the altar because they want to impress their parents. Or they want to impress the pastor. Or they want to impress a friend. Or they want everyone to think that they're spiritual. How many know all of those, how many know their action does not line up with what's actually in their mind? And a lot of times we can be so focused on trying to get someone's action to change that we actually lose sight of their heart and lose sight of who they are. Because, ladies and gentlemen, when you can minister to someone's heart and you change their heart, how many action will follow? Amen. So, true repentance is a change of mind and a change of action because of the change of mind. Okay? And so, John is making this announcement, repent, change the way you're thinking, the kingdom of heaven is coming. Now, turn to uh, Matthew 4, just flip over one. And I I love it. (laughs) I love when he sees Jesus. I mean, don't you know he's super excited when, he, when Jesus finally comes, and I love this statement. I mean, I had a, a few weeks where I just meditated on it. It's all I thought about. John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, that's all John could say. Behold, how I many know, oh, here comes the king. Because let me tell you something about this kingdom. This kingdom is a sinless kingdom. <clears throat> It's a sinless kingdom. How many know when you receive, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How many know this kingdom does not operate on sin consciousness? This kingdom does not operate on guilt and shame. This kingdom does not operate on condemnation. This kingdom had a lamb that took away the sin of the world, and the lamb who took away the sin of the world is actually also the king of this kingdom. And so when John the Baptist was coming and he was preaching this message, how many all of a sudden we're seeing Jews get baptized? How many of that had never happened before? you got to understand baptism was for the Gentiles. And what it was is a Gentile could renounce their ungodlessness, and then they could get baptized and they could become a convert. Okay? And so, but John is preaching this strong message of repentance, and all of a sudden we're seeing Jews get baptized. What's happening? John is revealing to mankind the failure of their self-righteousness. He's saying just because you're a Jew does not mean you're in. Amen. And how many know, anytime self-righteousness dies, it's a good and healthy thing in the kingdom of God. How many know there is no one in here that has more of a right to God than somebody else? There's no one in here that's any better than anybody else. How many know just because someone's been saved longer does not mean that they're necessarily more spiritual? Sometimes the most spiritual people you ever meet is someone who just got saved because all they're thinking about is Jesus. They're not thinking about the good things they've done or the bad things they've done. They're just, their eyes are on Jesus. And so John came, and so all of a sudden we're seeing Jewish people uh, get baptized, and they're recognizing that, that, that there's, a, there's, there's wrong in their life, there's sin in their life. But then John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here comes the king of the new kingdom, and this kingdom is not going to operate in sin. This kingdom is going to operate in righteousness. But it's not going to be a righteousness that you earn. It's going to be a righteousness that's given to you as a gift. Can I get an amen? I mean, there is no one in this room that's more right with God than somebody else. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, how many know that he that knew no sin became sin, that we could become the righteousness of God in him? And so when you receive Jesus, when you trip over the stumbling stone and then you stand on the cornerstone, you are now made, you're a new creation in Christ, you're now made the righteousness of God. Can I get an amen? It's the truth, folks. It's what the Bible says. It makes religion mad. It messes with people's pride. But ladies and gentlemen, righteousness is not a wage that you earn. It is a gift that you receive, and it is a hymn. Jesus is now your righteousness. And there's no one that has more righteousness than somebody else. You get saved, you receive that righteousness as a gift. And there's not different levels of it. It's one composite whole. And so here comes the king of this new kingdom, and, and Matthew 14, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, so this is Jesus' message. It's the message of the kingdom. There's a kingdom coming. But while Jesus was on this planet, you got to understand something. He's the only one that had the right to operate in the kingdom. Just hear me out for just a minute. He's the only one that had the right. Now, let me, let me, let me stop there and let me make this statement to you. Why is God so powerful? And y'all, some of y'all have heard me say this before. What's so, why is God so powerful? You know why he's so powerful? Because he's right. All of his power, all of his strength comes from this. God's right. Can I get an amen? See, how many know God cannot lie? If God spoke and said that the sun was blue, what would happen? It would turn blue, wouldn't it? Because he does not have the ability. His words come from a place of righteousness. And whatever he says, it happens. When he created, when he created and he saw darkness, he said, light be. He did not see darkness and say darkness. He saw darkness and spoke light. And he created with his words. Because the reality is, whatever God says, it happens. No matter what, if God, uh, the next, tomorrow, he said the sun is blue, all of a sudden the sun would turn blue because he sits in the seat of righteousness. And the reason he's so powerful is because he's right. How many of you know there's power in rightness? How many of you know when you are right about something, you, you will dig your heels in and take a stand? When you're right about something, how many of you have confidence? But that's the challenge when you're not right about something. How many of you don't have confidence? Because you're not right. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever been developed liars before. But I was a fabulous liar growing up, man. And because I had two major, I had two major um, people I had to lie to. My wife and my girlfriend. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> my wife, my wife and my girlfriend. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> And y'all said amen to that. My, my, my girlfriend and my mom is what I was trying to say. That'll preach, won't it? That's front page news right there. So he said, what? She said, don't let me get that microphone and beat you with that thing. No. When I would come home, because, you know, with, with us, you know, it got to the place where the drugs was not okay. Okay? And so... I would have to come home and I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to put a lie together for my mom. This is when I'm in high school. And then I'd have to put a lie together uh, for my girlfriend because the drugs weren't okay. And so I had to I had to lie effectively to both of them in order to keep from getting in trouble. And so if you know anything about lying or done any lying, the best lie is the one you believe yourself. And if you can convince yourself that you're right about your lie, then when you stand before the judge, my mom, my girlfriend, then you can make a statement with confidence. I mean, if you become a good liar, you can eventually fool yourself. I'm here to tell you right now, that's a dangerous place to be. Because when you don't have any footing on truth, you actually do not know who you are. And that's where people go crazy, and that's where people lose their minds, that's where people become things that they're not created to be or created to do. And so for me... You know, when I first started lying, when I was a kid, when I would lie, my ears would turn red because my conscience was still um, sensitive, and I, could, I wasn't a good liar. I would lie, and my eyes would get real big. I'd be like, no, I wasn't there. <laughs> my eyes are this big around, and my ears are turning red. Everybody's like, man, you lying. But then over time... As I begin to lie more and more and more, you know, by the time I'm, you know, a junior or senior in high school, I'm an accomplished liar. I can lie so hard that I can fool myself. Got to where I could sign my mom's name really, really good on all the stuff. And as I believed the lie, I could stand on something that was untrue but yet be somewhat confident in it. But when God comes in with his kingdom of truth, he wants to knock all the lies out from underneath you and tell you the truth. And how many of you know the truth is better than your lies? Can I get an amen? God's truth about you is better than any lie you've ever told to someone else to impress them. Because one of the things that causes people to lie is they try to impress other people. They would say, well, you know, it was like this. And how many of you know we can really exaggerate things to make ourselves look cool? 
But the reality is, God's truth about you is better than the best lie that you can tell. God's truth is better than that. And so, God comes in and knocks the lies down. How many know religion told a lot of lies about us? And a part of us renewing our mind is learning the truth of that. And so now, this kingdom that God brings in, God brings the power of his rightness into your life. And his rightness changes everything about you. Because when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, your wrongness leaves and God's rightness comes into your life. And now you are made the righteousness of God. And out of that identity, you begin to act right, talk right, live right, because God made you right. Can I get an amen? And so the reason that God is so powerful is that he's right. And so here comes Jesus. Now, how many know everyone else was born in sin? <clears throat> no one was born. How many know everyone was born in sin? And so when Jesus was born, how many know Jesus wasn't born in sin? Jesus was born of a virgin, right? And so when Jesus was born, all of a sudden, the righteousness of God came to earth. And so that's why when Jesus spoke, things happened. How many know 2,000 devils inside this man what's his name i mean what, what title do they give him i can't think of it right now the name was legion he came out of the gatherings correct and so he comes and then they come to jesus two thousand demons jesus says one word he says go from that one word two thousand demons are cast out of a man how why, why did he have so much power because he was the righteousness of God. He was right with God. How I many know he was sinless? See, the, under the law, the Bible says the curse causeless cannot come. And so <clears throat> under, under law, um, unless you fulfilled every aspect of the law, and nobody could, there was always a sense of sin. There was always a sense of curse. But how I many know when Jesus was born on this planet, he was born under the law, but he never broke the law. He never, ever transgressed it. So he lived 33 and a half years on this planet perfect in thought, word, and deed, born the righteousness of God. And so the kingdom of heaven infiltrated earth, and the king was here, and when the king spoke, things happened. Now, Jeremiah, if, if Jesus was the only one that operated in the kingdom, then how did the disciples have the power to do things? Well, how many know authority can be delegated? That's what he did. If you look at the scriptures, he, he had delegated the authority to 12 and how many of the 12 went out and cast out devils and healed the sick? How did they do it? Were they the righteousness of God? Absolutely not. How many of the disciples made mistakes? How many of they sinned? They acted silly. They would argue about who's the greatest. She'd just be like, dang, guys, come on now. And, but he delegated that authority and gave it to them. And then from the 12, he gave the authority to 70. And they went out, and they did miracles, and they did signs, and they did wonders, and they operated in the kingdom. But the whole time, this was delegated authority that was given. Amen? And we're just going to go to, like, one more verse, and we're going to close, because this is all we're going to do today. But let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, talking about the kingdom of God. God has invited us to operate in the kingdom of God today in 2015. How many of the kingdom of God is present and it's on this planet right now? And we're going to take a look at how we opt. Because Jesus had two primary messages. He revealed his father. I mean, he came to reveal God as a loving father. But then he also revealed the kingdom of God and how it operated in the earth. Because there was a clash of two kingdoms that was taking place. Matthew chapter 4 and in verse 23 it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demonized and possessed, epileptics, par paralytics, and he healed them. Now here's the thing. What's happening here? <clears throat> there is a clash of kingdoms. God's kingdom is... See, here's the thing. Before Jesus came, did anybody ever cast the devil out of anybody? No. If you got possessed under the old covenant, they killed you. Because they did not have the authority to cast the demon out of you. 
There's not one example of anybody casting a demon out of anybody in the Old Covenant. If you look under the Old Covenant, when someone got possessed with the devil, you took them out of the city and you stoned them. Because how many know that when Adam and Eve handed the authority over to the devil, the devil became the god of this world? Talks about over in Ephesians. Little g, not big g. But he, he had the dominion. And so, you know what? Under the old covenant, man, people are basically living under the, under the devil's dominion. God's still moving. God's still doing things. But there are certain things that mankind did not have the authority to do because God had to do those things as a man. When Jesus came, Jesus chained everything. But it's kind of like you know, if you have an apple and there's a, um, a, um, a spot on it that's bad, how I many know if you cut that spot off, you're going to preserve the apple? But if you leave that spot on there, the whole apple is going to turn bad. Well, under the old covenant, they didn't have the ability to heal the apple. They had to cut the leper off. They had to cut the possessed off. They had to start. And that's why it looked like a very merciless system. But in reality, it was mercy. But when Jesus came, everything was different. All of a sudden now, people that are possessed by the devil, how many know there's deliverance for those people? Because the kingdom of light is meeting the kingdom of darkness, and light is casting out darkness effortlessly. You never see light and dark fight. There's no fight. What are you talking about? Well, so let's say that we, we come in here on a Sunday night or something like that, and all the lights are out. I mean, all we got to do is strike one match, and the light runs to the cor- excuse me, the dark runs to the corners of the room. Why? Because light, light and dark don't fight. The presence of light dispels darkness. Y'all tracking me here? And so this confrontation that's taking place, Jesus, the King of this new kingdom is walking around operating in the kingdom of God. He's healing the sick, he's cleansing the lepers, he's raising the dead, and he is exercising heaven's will in the earth. Amen. And it's a beautiful thing. And then, but how many know that not only did he do it, but he also wants us to operate in that same kingdom? Can you get an amen? He wants to teach us how to operate in that kingdom. And so, last verse, and we close. And we'll probably pick up here next week. But I just, in Romans 14 and verse 17, I want to show you a quick definition of what the kingdom of God is. Romans 14 and in verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. The kingdom operates in righteousness. How many know when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you become the righteousness of God? When you know that you're right with God, you have peace. When you know that God is for you and you have peace, you automatically have joy. Everything in the kingdom of God operates on righteousness, peace, and joy. And that's why it's so important for children of God to know and understand that they've been made right with God. Because if you don't understand that you're right with God, it's going to be a challenge for you to operate in the kingdom. Even though you're already in the kingdom, even though the, the, the God is inside of you, it's going to be a challenge for you to operate in the kingdom if you do not believe that you're right with God. Why? Because you won't have any confidence. You will not have, See, for example, you know, like you know, when people are trying to, to come to America and they're trying to become a citizen, how I many know until they get their citizenship... They don't have the rights. You know, if I'm not an American citizen, I can't vote. If I'm not an American citizen, I can't, there are certain things that I can't do. Right? Supposed to be. I felt that. But that's the way this, that's the way this, uh, this country was set up. And so if I, don't, if I don't have that citizenship, then I'm not going to have the right to operate as a citizen. Okay? I'm not going to have the confidence to do that. And so, as a, as a child of God, when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you become the righteousness of God. And now, for you to operate in the kingdom of God, you need to understand that you're right with God. Can I get an amen? Folks, when you know that you're right with God, you have confidence when you pray. When you know that you're right with God, you have confidence when you're casting the devil out of somebody. You have confidence when you're praying for healing. You have confidence when you're praying for people that are sick. Why? Because you know that you are right with God. 
based on Jesus. It's a righteousness which is of faith, not a righteousness which is of works. Can I get an amen? And so the whole kingdom is upon that reality. And that's why it's important for us to get skillful in knowing that we're the righteousness of God so that the kingdom of God can operate through us so that we can be a blessing to other people. Can I get an amen? And that's why 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the enemy's trying to convince you that you're not right with God. Because if he can convince you that you're not right with God, you will not have confidence to operate in the kingdom. Even though there you are, a child of God in the kingdom, you won't have confidence to do so. Because it's not like there's one believer that has more authority than another believer. Can I get an amen? There's one, one person's prayer is not, powerful than, not more powerful than another person's prayer. One person doesn't have a better righteousness. No one person. How you know, just because I'm a pastor does not mean my prayer is more powerful. Please say amen to that. But, 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 but the reality is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does that mean? When you know you're the righteousness of God, you know that when you speak, things happen. But that confidence has got to be in Jesus' righteousness. It's been given to you as a gift, not a righteousness that you have earned. Because if it goes back to works, works righteousness, then what ends up happening is all your confidence is based in you. And you become arrogant. And you become a religious idiot. And you drive people away from God rather than bringing two people to, to God. There's nothing worse than holier than thou arrogant Christians. Can I get an amen? No, 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 no. Your righteousness is not something you earned or deserved. It's a gift. And so your confidence doesn't come from what you've done. Your confidence comes from what Jesus has done. Can I get an amen? And then when you stand before someone and you present the kingdom and miracles start to happen, signs and wonders start to happen, healing starts to happen, it always gives glory to the king of that kingdom. Not to the person doing the praying. Not to the person operating in the gifts. Can I get an amen? All right, we're going to stop. But we're starting. <laughs> we have started. And I really, God's just, there. I have so much on this. God's really been birthing this on the inside of me. It's beautiful. Let's stand to our feet. God wants us to operate in the kingdom of heaven. How many know the kingdom of heaven is greater than the governments of this world? Greater 